I'm just going to jump in and take a second to welcome those who are, are in our session now. We are expecting quite a few people right across Canada, so I'm extremely excited uh, to be able to offer this to all of our parents and caregivers that are interested in learning more about the IEP. My name is Christine Staley. I am the Executive Director of Dyslexia Canada. Dyslexia Canada is a national charity that is focused on ensuring that children with dyslexia and reading difficulties have access to meaningful education right across the country. So with that, I, again, am pleased to offer this program to all of you. It's one of the um, you know, top 10 questions we get asked or the emails we get and the phone calls we get is what is an IEP? What does it look like? How do I prepare for it? Um, and there's so many questions surrounding it. So I am honored to be able to provide some information and some insight to you and have brought Dr. Catherine Barford here to speak to everyone today and give us a little more information and insight into the IEP as she is certainly an expert in this field. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Garforth to introduce herself. So my name is Dr. Catherine Garforth and you can get tonight's slides or a, a handout version so it's not in PowerPoint. Uh, so you can access the information that I'm gonna be sharing with you. Now, at first, I want to start out with just explaining who I am. And the important thing for you to realize is that I have worn many hats as a dyslexic myself. So I am severely dyslexic. I went through the public education system with a huge struggle. And then I ended up, was fortunate enough to go to some private schools specializing in dyslexia. So going from a barely literate grade five, I've made it all the way through to get my PhD. Um, throughout my schooling, I have played many roles as a self-advocate and an advocate for others um, through the IDA and um, the Human Rights Committees. Uh, I was part of something with the Ontario Human Rights Commission, for those of you in Ontario and the Alberta Community of Citizens with Disabilities. The Elton Burton's here. Um, I also am a parent. I have three children. One of them is severely dyslexic, and I do have a child on the autism spectrum. So I do know the IEP from many different perspectives. I have a education degree, so I, I have done teaching. I have been a tutor. Um, I have helped people as many different uh, advocacy roles and helping them understand their child's psych ed and preparing them for that IEP meeting. So technically speaking, the doctor in front of my name is because I have a PhD in educational psychology and special education. So basically I've gone to school for a lot of years <laughs> to get the book smarts on this, but I do have the personal experience as an individual with dyslexia who had an IEP. I have two children with IEPs at school currently, and I was busy emailing last night and this morning about their IEPs. So I do understand it from many perspectives. So today I want to cover a lot, and I know I'm not going to be able to cover everything I want, um, but I am going to be pointing you to different resources and opportunities for you to get more information. So let's begin looking at a little bit of a background about an IEP or an individualized education plan. Then we'll go through the process, the terms, and I'm going to help you get a better understanding of the best ways to understand your child and their needs. I will also be discussing the very important IEP binder and providing you with suggestions on how to prepare for any upcoming IEP meetings you may have. So you might be wondering why we have IEPs. Well, they're not new. They've been around for about four and a half decades and or more than four and a half decades. They were 
first introduced in 1975 around the world with the goal of allowing the, uh, every student, regardless of whether they were neurotypical or neurodiverse, to have access to the same education as their peers. And this IEP document was designed to help make sure they were given that access. And if we fast forward to today, the goal remains the same, but we have a better understanding of what our students need, how they learn, how we can best support them. And of course, we've made huge technological advances to provide assistive technology for our students. And we're at the point where UNESCO, the United Nations, has even mentioned the importance and the inclusion of IEPs in special education, and that was found in their inclusive education population. All right, so this is the definition that's coming from the Save the Children from the UNESCO, and it's saying that an IEP is a document that helps teachers track student progress against their individual learning goals. So these are the goals and objectives that we create in the IEP. It should be completed by the teacher in close collaboration with the child's parents and as much as possible, the child himself or themselves. And I'll be talking about that a little bit more later in this presentation. In schools where children are taught by multiple teachers, the adults need to work together to ensure that the IEP is well-informed and closely followed. In the case of the children with disabilities, the IEP can also help adopt a holistic approach to the child's development and overall autonomy, linking education, rehabilitative and social aspects together. So it's also advisable to include health personnel, social workers and the development wherever possible, thus creating a multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary team. Now, the important thing to note is specific learning disabilities such as dyslexia often have comorbidities. So whether your child just has something like dyslexia or they have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder or other issues, those should be all listed in their IEP. So the process of the IEP is the same for all students. It's just how it plays out is a little bit different. It all starts with an identification and an assessment. Then it goes into the planning stage, the program and support, the evaluation of the psych ed and then reporting. So the identification and assessment stage is one that will have happened when your child gets flagged for not meeting the curricular goals. And this is when you start to question whether there is something happening and they might have a learning disability. Um, and that means that you're gonna get the psychoeducational assessment or the document that diagnoses your child with a specific learning disability like dyslexia. Yeah. Then we're gonna have the assessment, which is that big document that can be very intimidating as a parent to go through because it's full of jargon and difficult information. But this is what's going to really help guide the individualized education plan or program. Then it comes to the planning stage. Now, this is that collaborative stage that happens between you and the school. In my experience as a advocate and a parent, the parents are typically asked to fill out a form and then they are asked to submit it to the school. The school reviews this form and creates the IEP. Each year you're gonna go back and review the goals and objectives that you had in the previous year and discuss any changes that should be made. Now, the planning process is definitely the part where you need to take that active role to make sure that your child's needs are being met. Now, we're gonna discuss some of this terminology after we go through the process. Then comes to the programming and support. So after you have had that IEP meeting and made the changes to your child's 
IEP, you're going to have the time where the IEP is put into use within the school. So they're going to be using those accommodations or adaptations that you discussed to help support your child with their learning and addressing those goals and objectives that you created in the IEP for your child. When we're coming up to an IEP review, there's gonna be an evaluation of the goals of objectives that were made to make sure that what you have put forth in the IEP is working. Okay, so back to the task at hand. The evaluation is, as we were saying, assessing the goals in the IEP to make sure they're appropriate. Uh, then after we have the, um, sorry, I just pulled up the question and answer and I can't get rid of it. <laughs> advance my slides there we go all right sorry um so we have this iep cycle that takes place once your child has an iep and that's why the school will often refer to it as a living document right because each year we're going to be revisiting the iep to make sure that everything we have addressed is still relevant hopefully your child is making progress towards their goals and objectives and we're able to change them. We're gonna judge the implementation. So are the teachers able to do the plans and the goals, provide the support that your child needs in the classroom? We're gonna evaluate it. And this is really important when we're talking about accommodations to make sure that they're appropriate. One thing that I like to talk about when we're talking about accommodations and during this evaluation progress or process is that just because it's an accommodation or a strategy that works for some dyslexics, it doesn't mean it's going to work for all dyslexics. Then we have the reporting. So your child should be getting the report card with their peers, but they should also be getting information about how they're meeting their goals and objectives. And then we go back into the cycle again. So let's talk over some of those IEP terminologies that we've seen so far in this presentation and you may not be super familiar with. The first one is the adaptation or the accommodation. So these are the strategies and the materials that are used by the student and their teachers to make sure that they're learning the information the teacher is teaching in the classroom and their ability to show their knowledge. Now, accommodations or adaptations do not change what your child is expected to learn from the curriculum. So they are expected to learn everything their peers are, they just get it in different ways. So for example, they could be using an iPad with Speechify so they can take photos, um, text, and have it read to them. And this is a, a great accommodation that's really helpful, especially when you have things like worksheets and the teacher isn't always available to read what's on the worksheet. And it gives the your child a little bit more independence. It's giving them extra time on assignments and tests. Writing a test in a separate location to limit the distractions. And, you know, having materials available in advance. Some of our uh, kids with specific learning disabilities have issues with processing speed and working memory. So it's really helpful for them to get the information before they're taught in class so they can learn it in advance. And then when they learn it with the class, they're already aware of the concepts that are being discussed. Then the other thing is modifications. Now modifications actually change what your child is expected to learn and takes them off the same learning track as their peers. Now this can be in one area or across the curriculum. The important thing to know is that this has the potential to change your child's ability to graduate with a high school diploma. They would get a completion certificate. Now this doesn't mean that a modification 
isn't the right choice for your child and modifications do not have to be permanent. For example, if you have a child with a specific learning disability in reading or dyslexia, and they're not currently able to read at grade level, you could modify their program in language arts to make sure that they're catching up on those important early reading skills so they have an intensive intervention to give them the ability to catch up to their peers. Or if they have something like dyscalculia, making sure that they have those foundational math skills so that they can then catch up with their peers. And this can make a huge difference to them in the long term. So remember that modifications aren't necessarily bad. They may be the right choice for your child in certain subject areas. But when you decide to make that modification, if you feel like your child can catch up, make sure there's an exit strategy for that modification so they can return to the curriculum. Then we come to transition planning. Now this is a very important part of your child's education, especially as they move through their education. As we know, school gets harder as we progress and children are expected to take on more and more responsibilities. Now, it's best if we can make sure we have the support in place for them to succeed. This is done with a transition plan. You can have goals and objectives in your child's IEP that help prepare them for their upcoming transition. I do wanna highlight that you should be having a separate transition planning meeting to discuss the things that need to be done to help prepare your child for the next transition. So this could be helping them use an agenda, teaching them how to open a combination lock. Now this is something that is often overlooked and can be very difficult for some children to learn. So make sure that if your child's approaching one of those transitions, so from primary school to the intermediate grades, to middle school, to high school, and even after life in high school, understanding how to make those transitions successful for your child are extremely important. Then we come to the goals and objectives. This is the meat and potatoes of the IEP. This is how we're gonna let everybody be on the same page on how your child's education is different from their peers. And the specific skills that are not part of the curriculum during the school year. Goals and objectives are the part that you wanna focus on as a parent to make sure that they're appropriate for your child. And this is where you need to be that advocate for your child and have that critical eye to see whether it's what's best for your child. One of the things that I often see left out of goals and objectives is making sure students or your child can print the alphabet fluently. This is a skill that a lot of schools are pushing towards children using assistive technology and typing, but it's still essential for them to be able to write things down by hand when they need to. Um, and in many IEPs, you'll see the main goal. So that's gonna have to do with uh, maybe social, emotional or advocacy issues and also the academic issues. It will be a, typically a fairly broad statement. I'm often seeing these currently just being taken from the curriculum itself. And it's difficult to often get the schools to really narrow it in. The objectives are the small steps that are gonna be taken to help your child meet that ultimate goal. And then you'll see a list of strategies that the school can use to support your child. 
these are what you're going to be working towards in the year and what the school is going to be using to evaluate the process during their IEP. The biggest Catherine, thing, yes. Can I, can I jump in for just one second? And I, I know that um, we will be doing a follow-up webinar uh, with you in February. Yes specifically yes. looking at the goals and objectives and, and how to make sure they, as you said, that they're, they're meaty. But can you just give us an example of what a, a good goal or objective looks like? What could that be? Sure. Um, so uh, for one of my children, the, the handwriting thing <laughs> was one of the goals that we added because they are not fluent on their letter formation and it takes a lot of effort for them to print the alphabet. So we want children to be able to write A to Z without effort and without having to really think of the letter formation. We want it to be automatic so that they know how an A looks like in capital and lowercase and be able to write it. So you want them to have a goal or objectives or, or parts of the goal that first we want them to write the alphabet A to Z without much effort. Then we want them to recognize the difference between upper and lowercase letters. After they've got to that point, we want to make sure that the sizing is correct and they can do that without effort, right? Another goal could be getting the child um, familiar with assistive technology, right? And the assistive technology that they're using. So the goal is for the child to be able to independently use Speechify. Well, first we need to get them familiar with the app on their tablet. So how do they take the picture and how do they get them to read? And then being able to do it with support and then taking away the support so that they can do it individually. So you wanna make sure that there is a definite plan for how things are gonna be done. When it comes to working on things like a child's phonics, I typically ask for a scope and sequence. And what I mean by that is the order that they're gonna teach the letters and the sounds to the child so that everybody can be on the same page. If you're in a position to be able to provide extra uh, support for your child outside of the school system, you wanna make sure that you're trying to follow the same path and program for the, the child so that you're not confusing them and not trying to teach them two different methods. Consistency is key, especially when we're working with these students or with your child when they're just at the beginning and they're struggling so much at school and they just want to succeed. I mean, today I saw, I think a post, it was on Twitter about fake reading, right? And if, if you have a severely dyslexic child, that has a really good memory, they'll memorize. And especially when we're using these predictable texts, they figure out the sentence starter after being corrected once or twice and they guess from the pictures, right? Um, so it's all about making sure that you have the appropriate um, curriculum and the outline for getting these goals and objectives meaningful for your child. And that's where this understanding your child is so important. And whether you like it or not, the best way to do this is to get familiar with your child's psychoeducational assessment. Now, I know this is a very intimidating document that is full of jargon and it's very difficult to go through. Even for me, when I go through my children's psych ads, I find it to be a very emotional process. And I go through psychoeducational assessments on a regular basis. And I've been doing that since I've been in high school, helping other people advocate for their children. So what I want you to do when you go through this document is to really learn about your child's strengths and stretches. And this is where you're gonna learn about it in the reporting of the results. And this is the section that's full of jargon and very intimidating. 
because you're going to be reading terms like phonological processing or mathematical fluency. And these are terms that I'm not expecting you to be familiar with unless you're a school psychologist or an educator that has training with that. And I have created a YouTube channel called Psych Ed Terms Explained, and I will post a link to that um, for you if you give me a second. Um, Sorry, without my presenter notes, I can't do it easily from the uh, slide. So I'm gonna post that in the chat, the psych ed terms explained. Um, so in the psych ed terms explained, you're gonna find those terms from your child's psychoeducational assessment. And I'm gonna tell you what they mean so that you can have a better understanding of what your child's strength or weaknesses. This is gonna help you during that IEP meeting understand if the goals and objectives are appropriate for your child. So for example, if your child struggles with uh, math fluency, that's their rapid awareness of basic, simple addition, subtraction and multiplication questions. This is something that we definitely wanna build fluency on. So we're gonna have a goal for them to work on this. But in class, we want the accommodation of them using a calculator so that they're not forced to use a skill that they're weak on in something like a, a multi-digit addition question or long division or multiplication. They're gonna have the resources that they can do to do the task at hand. And that's one of the biggest things when it comes to accommodations, goals, and objectives. You wanna make sure that your child is only being assessed on what their peers are being assessed on. So by that, I mean, if the classroom is doing an assignment on long division and your child struggles with those basic addition, subtraction and multiplication facts, we want them to be able to use a calculator to get those answers, but still show all the work so that they understand the process and are not being docked marks because they couldn't do six times seven, right? Um, so, sorry, back to the psychoeducational assessment. I'm not expecting you to go through this document before every IEP meeting. What I want you to do is to create a crib sheet so that you understand your child's strengths and weaknesses. So you know that they're good with their, you know, their long-term memory or their working memory. And you can use those strengths to help support the weaknesses. The reason why it's so important for you to go through the psychoeducational assessment so that you can understand it and explain it is because realistically, their classroom teacher is not gonna spend the time to go through this document every year. And you'll be lucky if you have a resource teacher that has the time to go through each of these documents individually on a regular basis. This is because they have so many students on their caseload that they need to do this. And the reality is the teacher education programs do not teach teachers how to go through these assessments critically and get the information out of this. So I do these sorts of presentations for teachers and special educators, and I give them the same resources. They also get links to the Psych Ed Terms Explained YouTube channel because it's a three or four minute video they can, they can watch and just refresh their memory. These are terms that if you don't use them every day, they're easy to forget, okay? So the next thing that I want to talk about 
is the IEP binder and I'm gonna um, stop my screen share uh, because I'm actually gonna show you an IEP binder uh, and then we will go back to slides. So this is one of my children's IEP binders and um, what it is is it has everything that I need for the IEP meetings in one spot so I can refer to it on a regular basis whenever I have anything. So it starts out with an about me page and I've put a blank one so you don't see how he filled it out and this gives the information about how my child is this year. Now, most schools often have a document like this. I still find having um, this information available helps me and it's not the school one, it's fun and it's something that I can do with my child together. Then I have information about the school. So I have the contact list of everybody that I need to contact after school with the inclusion of outside support. So if I have an advocate that helps me for things, I have it all on one page uh, for me to reference quickly. Now, I also have a communication log. And this is where I'm gonna keep track of all the conversations that I have with the teachers and principals or anybody on my child's team. I have a quick sheet reference that has the date, notes about the conversation and whether it was an email. Any conversation I'm having with the school about my child's education, I am following up with an email because if it's not in an email, it never happened and I can't reference it, right? So then I print off all the emails and I put them behind so that during an IEP meeting, I can say, hey, look, on this date, we talked about that. And before the IEP meeting, I go through my binder and I put sticky notes and post-its notes, so I can quickly reference it. Then I have, you know, the, uh, the psych ed assessment and the various assessments that we have, and then a section for the current IEP, school report cards, other information. And then I also have uh, this, which is a glossary. And these are all the terms <laughs> that I may come across. Oh, well, I personally, I'm fine without this. Um, but the terms that I'm going to come across about IEP meetings uh, and having a student in the special education system, right, or having additional learning needs so that you can understand that. And then I have a section for notes. So when I'm going into an IEP meeting, I go in with a plan. I know what I'm advocating for and how I'm looking for support for my child. Now, I do have a slide that um, shows you everything that is within that binder. And I'll just share my screen again so you can see it. Um, so now this binder is for you. So put what's important for you within that binder. Um, as I said, these binders are what you need. I do create these for my clients. So that's why I have it all set up with a couple of sections I don't necessarily need. But it's very important that you have everything you need in one place because you don't want to be flustered in the meeting, say, oh, I know I have that somewhere, but where is it? Or, you know, throughout the year, just stick everything, file it in, be religious about it because you're going to sit think yourself in the future. It really makes a huge difference to have it consolidated in one place. Now, preparing for that IEP meeting is daunting, intimidating, and something you do after you've cleaned everything in your house top to bottom. Um, or at least <laughs> that's how many people do it. So you want to review the recent reports that you've had. So the, any informal assessments, report cards, uh, the communication that you've had with the school, use your post-it notes, flag them if you want to refer to them, and the previous IEP. You want to speak to your child. Now, I know a lot of schools try and encourage students to take part of their IEP meetings starting about grade five. 
personally, I think it's very important for children to be part of IEP meetings when they are ready. So it all depends when your child has gotten their diagnosis and their acceptance of the diagnosis, especially in those intermediate and early high school years, if your child is not ready to face their diagnosis and accept it, it's more important that you work on that and the advocacy skills before forcing them into this meeting because it can be a very emotional meeting for everyone involved. And if your child's just gonna shut down and break down, it's not beneficial for anyone in the meeting. It's also important to remember that these meetings can be very emotional for you as a parent. And I probably don't need to remind you of that, especially if you struggled at school yourself and it brings up the fears and emotions and trauma that you went through in school. Now, I want you to come up with a list or a plan for your IEP meeting. This needs to have a list of the must-haves that you need in that IEP meeting for the next year. I also want you to come up with a few things that you can compromise on that would be niceties. And of course, it would be wonderful if they were in the IEP meeting, but you're willing to negotiate because you have to go into this meeting as a team player, but also as a coach. So you have to realize that there are only so many things the school can focus on in an academic year. They have a number of students and limited resources. And unfortunately, our students with dyslexia are the bottom of the totem pole for support and help, especially if they don't have any additional behavior issues and they aren't drawing attention to themselves. Hopefully this will change, but where we're at today, it's not at a place where our kids' needs are high priority for everyone. But the school does want what's best for your child. So it's important to recognize that they are wanting to help your child. They're just trying to be realistic with how they can. My other piece of advice is find someone to go to the meeting with you. Whether you pay for a professional advocate to join you or whether it's a friend that understands the process, it's really important to have a person on your side of the table or your side of the Zoom meeting, however it's happening, to help you stay on task. They need to be familiar with your plan and they also need be, to be there to help take notes and take over if there's a point where you can't and you need to refresh. That brings me to the IEP meeting bag. Now, this is everything I want you to take into the IEP meeting so that you are ready. You need to have your IEP binder. You need to have your plan. You need to have a pen and paper for notes because even though you have that advocate with you to help you take notes, there are going to be things that you're going to want to jot down and it may be sort of a, a soothing thing for you. Take a picture of your child in a picture frame and have it so everybody can see it. That's just reminding them that we are talking about a human being that's very important to you and a very important part of their school. Take hard candies, whether it's a mint, Mentos, something that you can suck on. The reason why I say this is because it triggers your brain into a soothing, relaxing sensation. And that's just a strategy to help your body calm your nerves. Take a moment if you need to, to reset. Bring a water bottle because in those stressful situations, it's very easy to get a very dry throat. And again, the act of just drinking gives you a second to collect your thoughts and refresh. It gives you that accepted break, right? No one's going to be upset if you take a moment to take a sip of water. Also take a box of tissues because this is a very emotional process. You are looking at your child's life and want them to be as successful as possible. The school is only focusing on the year ahead. 
you have been with your child from the beginning and you want what's best for them. The school wants what's best for them too, but they have just a chapter of your child's life and you're looking at the whole thing. Now, I do have a couple of final thoughts before we open it up for questions. Um, I know that you probably are wanting more and saying, okay, well, I wish you went into more in this detail or in this area. Now, I want to offer you the opportunity to join me on a free 15 connection call, 15 minute connection call. This is not a sales call. I am not going to try and sell you anything. I'm going to try to point you to free resources that you can use to help prepare for your IEP meeting. I know how difficult these can be and I know how important they are. So I want to try and make sure you get the support you need to prepare for these IEP meetings. The second thing that I want to let you know about is I have created a membership program called the Parent Advocacy Gateway. Now this is something that has a bunch of courses. Uh, one of the courses is a parent's guide to IEPs and that's what some of this presentation was based on. I also have a parent's guide to psychoeducational assessments within their executive functioning and reading development as well as a bunch of other really good resources. And since you uh, joined me on this call, I wanna you know, reward you and uh, give you access to that for a uh, discount. Uh, so it's $27 to have a 30 day access to this. And yeah, so I would love to see what you have to say and any ways that I can help you more. So hit me up with your questions. So just in and again, anyone who has a question, please feel free to to type it into the Q&A. And I wanted to ask you one thing that has been coming up more and more mm -hmm. is um, we're, we have parents that are contacting us saying they're, you know, with dyslexia, their child is also managing mental health issues or behavioral issues yes. and is it okay to bring that even though there may not be a formal diagnosis in any sort of mental health issue or, or behavioral issue can we bring that to the IEP meeting as well and discuss that if you are willing to discuss and disclose it definitely and uh that kind of taps into another passion of mine and that's executive functioning development and executive functions are like the CEO of our brain and any child with a neurodiversity such as a learning disability like dyslexia has a delayed development of executive functions. And executive functions are the skills that we need to control our emotions and regulate our behavior. So if we have a delay in this development, then we need to make sure that the support is in place. And that's exactly what we need to discuss in the IEP meeting. And I find that a lot of the goals and objectives, especially when it comes to advocacy and regulating and asking for help, they're putting them in way too early when the child's not developmentally ready for them or having the ability to do them. Now, a lot of our kiddos with a learning disability struggle with working memory. And that is one of the executive functions that we have. And it's that little mental scratch pad in your mind to help remember the instructions or what they're supposed to do. It's when they're taking notes, not being able to keep up fast enough, um, especially when it comes to kids that don't have that fluency or automaticity. So they don't know how a word is spelled. So they have to sound it out. And as they sounded out, that's using stuff in their working memory. So it, it just it takes it away. And when you, when you look at things at that broader perspective, you're like, there's no way my child can succeed at this. We're setting them up for failure. And the point of the IEP is to set them up for success. So we need to take more of that holistic approach to understand where they're at. And of course, <laughs> Learning disabilities make life a lot more difficult. Yes, it can be seen as a gift, but it comes at a huge cost. And it's very difficult and it's very hard for these young people to accept, understand, 
and self-advocate for, especially when they're just coming into a diagnosis. I mean, I see kids that haven't even had a diagnosis for six months that are expected to advocate and ask for extra time. And then you, you have the kids that are the people pleasers and they don't, they'll say yes to anything the teacher says because they want the teacher to see how good they are. But even though reading aloud in class is the last thing on earth that they wanna do, but they want their teacher to be pride, so they do it. And their teacher asks them to know to be part of the spelling test, even though they study all week for hours and get one out of 10 right. It's, it's making sure that the demands are appropriate for the child's level um, development and what they need to do. And if we keep on giving them these demands that are too high for them and not appropriate for where they're at, of course, it's going to give them problems with mental health issues, right? And have them to shut down and have that Coke bottle moment. If you're not familiar with that, that's the child doing everything they can to hide everything from everyone at school, how much they're struggling, how much they're hurting how difficult it is. And then as soon as they get home, they explode and blow up and the world is everywhere. And everybody tells you how wonderful your child is. And you know, they are, you know, they are awesome and amazing and trying their best, but at home, you can't even get them to put their backpack away. Right. Or hang up their jacket or do their homework. And yes, I live this. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's making sure that they understand your child's so emotional needs, right? Um, so we need to make sure that your whole child is being addressed during these IEP meetings and having the support and saying, look, that's not appropriate for my child. And you know what? We need to have, you know, these, I call them schema cards, but it's like, okay, so when you get an assignment, this is what you're supposed to do. Um, one that I just created for a client was for journal. Okay, so you get your journal, you find your pencil and eraser, you write the title, you write the date, you write your sentences, then you take it to your teacher and they proofread it and then you draw. But just having that there just removes so much stress because it has the step-by-step -step instructions and it's an accommodation that's giving the child what they need and not making them have to go up to ask the teacher a million times what they're supposed to do because they can't remember, right? We want these kids to succeed. We wanna set them up to succeed and we wanna set them up for independence, right? And that makes them feel good. So I have, I've got a couple questions here. I'm going to actually, push them into one, because uh, there's a couple of themes here uh, from these questions that we're getting. And it's all focused on um, a, when do you get a, a formal diagnosis? When should you get that test? Do you actually need to get a formal diagnosis to move forward with an IEP? And what are the advantages of having an IPRC, and I don't know if, if right across Canada, it's called the same thing. So um, I'm here in Ontario and an IPRC is our identification um, and placement committee meetings where a child is specifically identified as being exceptional. And then you move on to get an IEP. Um, so I'm not sure if every province has something That's similar. Not... So the questions really are around, do you have to get a psych ed to move forward with an IEP? When should you get it? Should you get it? Um, and, and what are your thoughts on that? Okay. <laughs> that could be an hour on its own. Right? <laughs> um, so there are a couple ways to approach to answering that question. If you are looking at the best interest of your child to get the quickest remediation, as soon as you are concerned, I would uh, suggest getting a screening assessment done on your child because the most effective time for in intervention on a child is in K-1-2 that's where you're gonna get the biggest bang for your buck for intervention, 
they're going to make the biggest progress and they're not going to fall behind. Unfortunately, our schools are not currently set up to do this in an effective matter that you can say, I want this and know you're going to get the same thing at every school and have the teachers know what to do and know what to do with the information. Uh, there are private practitioners that do do this and they can say, um, I mean, when I do them, I, there are free screening tests available that you can use to screen, identify and get the support that you need to help your child work on things. As far as assessments go or a formal psychoeducational assessment, you can get them done at that age. They're not as reliable and you're not likely gonna get the formal diagnosis of a specific learning disability. They're very expensive tests to get. Um, I mean, up here, they're about $3,500. I'm sorry, like over here in BC. And that's a lot of money. Um, so in the, the K-1, two years, unless you're needing it for something like an autism assessment, I wouldn't do it. Yes, it's gonna provide somewhat good information, but it's not really designed to get the support for a child at that level, right? Now, if you really, really want that specific learning disability diagnosis, so it's either reading, writing, or mathematics, and that includes dyslexia, um, there's it's toss it in the air do you wait till they're at an age to get that and miss the opportunity for the invent intervention i wouldn't uh just because you're going to get better support and help your child more and save them a lot but they're not necessarily going to get the diagnosis and the support you often need the formal diagnosis from a psych ed to get the designation to have an IEP. I remember with my children, it was, well, you're not gonna get any more until you get a formal diagnosis because that gives them designation to get the IEP schools say that they should be getting the same types of support but it's not always the case it's just currently a really frustrating process and i applaud all of you parents because you are doing the best that you can to help your children and it's so important they are so lucky to have you um you know, it's, I know how difficult it is and how frustrating it is, uh, how thankless it is, but know that you are doing what is best for your child. And that's got to give you <laughs> um, something. Um, I'm just putting the link. Um, if you want to talk to me for that 15 minute connection call, I can give you more specific advice where you can give me more information and I can say, okay, well, this is what I would do. Um, but it, it's, it's tricky. It's frustrating. And I'm sorry that you have to go through it. And I will just remind everyone, we are recording this. We'll send out the recording probably within the next two days. And I'll also include in the email all of these links um, that uh, Dr. Garforth is providing again, just in case anyone has missed it. And I just want to ask one last uh, question, just noticing the time, sure. um, just for, for parents who might be going to their first IEP meeting. Um, at the end of the meeting, usually documentation will be placed in front of you. There's a place for your signature. You will be asked if you agree and to sign off on the IEP of the day. So I just, you know, to kind of wrap it up, if um, uh, Dr. Garforth, if you could just give us thoughts on the ending of the meeting and, and sort of what parents should do, should think about and maybe take away. Hopefully the meeting will lead to changes and you'll get the support that the, there'll be revisions um 
personally, I'm very hesitant to sign anything until I'm completely happy with it. And you can ask them for the revisions. I mean, often you're thrown into a 30 minute time slot and you have no, there's no, nowhere near enough time to cover everything that you need to cover. And don't be afraid to ask for it to go longer or to reschedule to do a follow-up and make sure it fits with your schedule and you know what if you're having a bad day and you can't face it say i'm sorry i have to reschedule um you gotta put your put your foot down and be willing to say this is what i need and they have to respect that because they reschedule things all the time and yes it may not be convenient um but it, it's what we need to do for the best thing for your child. And that's what you're concerned about, right? You're advocating for your child and your child alone in this meeting. And I know it's especially hard if you have more information about better supports and you can't be on a crusade to change the school during the IEP meeting you need to be on a crusade for your child. This is only about your child and this is all that you're asking for and you're not asking them to change it for every other kid in their school. That can be a different conversation on a different day. This is my child, my child's education and we need to worry about how they're doing as a little human that's growing up because we wanna prevent trauma in the future, right? So you got to put your foot down and you're not trying to be mean and you realize that you're both looking out for your child's best interests. You just have different views of what that is, but you also need to be realistic about what's going to be done. Know that in the classroom, there can be up to close to like, I don't know, 28 kids. And it's impossible for one classroom teacher to spend half an hour a day working one-on-one -on -one with your child. We need to make sure that the IEP has strategies and supports in place that that teacher can make sure your child is getting the supports that they need as they're teaching everybody else, right? So that's we, why we have the accommodations and the assistive technology to give that teacher a fighting chance at meeting your child's needs while working with everybody in the class. And it's not just your child that has those exceptional needs, right? So we have to be cognizant of that, right? And also for the special education teacher who has how many kids on their caseload? Yes, in a perfect world, they would love to be spending, you know, one-on-one -on -one time with your child an hour a day, five days a week. They would love nothing more than that, but the reality is that they can't. So the IEP is trying to find a solution to make sure that the school can do the best thing they can for your child, given the constraints of the system, right? Your child's not getting any additional funding. They do not get any additional faculty for your child and they don't get any additional training. Mm -hmm. The, the, the amount of a teacher education program that is focused on specific learning disabilities is maybe three hours in their entire training. If they have a personal interest in it, it's all done on their own time, right? And the teacher education programs across Canada do not currently provide them with training on how to teach our children how to read based on the science of reading, right? On the best strategies, to teach them. So if your teacher has gone above and beyond and got this training personally, that's amazing. You're so lucky. But you can't blame them for the shortfalls in the system, right? I mean, we have the right to read inquiry in Ontario. I'm really hoping that gets out soon because we need to change the curriculums to make sure that these kids are getting the support that they need and the teachers are getting the training to understand how to support them, right? 
so I guess that kind of went off topic, but <laughs> that's my soapbox moment. <laughs> So I want just, I'm noticing the time. Thank you so much for all of this information. I, I can tell you, I've been madly scribbling notes and just even your, your advice to make a crib sheet um, of the, the psych ed report so you don't have to go back to it and you can provide that. It, it, that's genius. I don't know, you know, I, I've been going to these IEP meetings now for years and I'm not sure why I never thought of having my little cheat sheet instead of having no, to make a glossary. By year, so thank you. Make a glossary of the terms That's in your child's cool. psych ed that are important to you, right? Perfect. You don't have to go like just make it as easy as you possibly can for yourself to prepare for the meetings in advance. Because every time you go through them, it's like facing the diagnosis all over again and the emotions yeah. involved with them. And is extremely personal and emotional. And you hear about all the sob stories. And in those IP meetings, you're not thinking about the big success stories. I mean, I'm not thinking about myself with a PhD. I'm thinking of myself about the, you know, the scared, crumpled student, not the success that I've gotten when I'm going into my children's IP meetings. I'm thinking about all the trauma. So mm -hmm. I need to make it as easy for myself as I can. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm seeing some thank yous coming in from in the chats and the Q&A. And I just want to let everyone know, um, and I had mentioned it at the very beginning. So, you know, this was a kind of a brief overview of the IEP process and the meetings, but please check out our website. We have a registration link for a follow-up program um, that Dr. Garforth is going to be doing for us to really zone in on what the IEP should look like and what you, you know, what you should be looking for and asking for and, and discussing the goals and the, the objectives of the IEP. So please go on our website and, and register for that program as yeah, well. I, I will be taking actual IEPs that I've worked on with people and say, so this is what the school had and this is how we fixed it, <laughs> right? Wonderful. Because there are so many times where you, you get this random goal that's very too open and you're like okay well how does that actually help my child learn how to read there's a lot of cutting and pasting i think that goes on in, in you know what i have a document for british columbia that they cut and paste from and that's not individualized yes and i also want to just again just mention to all of the parents you are not in this alone so so again, we'll send the information um, and the contact information to Dr. Garforth. You can reach out to, to Dyslexia Canada, um, go to our website, feel free to email me. My information is on, on the website. We also have an amazing program called Community Connections. It's an online one-on-one -on -one peer support program where we match parents up with other parents because sometimes you just need an ear to listen. You just need a shoulder to cry on. And sometimes it can just be great to share stories, what worked, what didn't. Um, so please, you know, take advantage of all of us who are navigating that, have navigated it, take advantage of, of the expertise that we are gathering in our community. So with that, I would once again like to thank everyone for joining us today um, right, across, right across Canada. And thank you, uh, Dr. Garforth, for providing all of this information and all of these resources. It's invaluable to-, uh, to There all is a link on my website that has blog and resources that has links to things where I go into the terminology and I go everything to explicitly. But I mean, the best way is just get that 15 minute connection call and you can say, I need this. And I can say, okay, you can find it right here. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone. and. Have a good evening or, or a good night, depending on where you're coming in from. Take care. Take care, everyone.